I'm Charlotte Waters. I'm here with Joan Keefe um, on January 6, 2007 in Sargeries, New York. Hello, Joan. Hi. Hello. Um, when and where were you born? In Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, Jan February 22, 1921. Um, in growing up, like, in school and stuff, did you have any idea of what you wanted to be doing in the future? No, when I was really little, I just said, like a lot of kids say funny things. So they tell me, I said, I wanted to be a lady with a baby. <laughs> and then another thing I wanted to be is a sailor's girl. But, so I didn't have any. Um, so what did you do right out of high school? Uh, I went to work in um, Bel Bend Bendix Radio in Baltimore. The war was starting. And, uh, no, it hadn't started, but meeting up with her. So we, I went to Bendix Radio and worked there until I went into Wax. And that, they made all radio stuff and Signal Corps stuff for the Army. And, all. and I worked in, uh, with, in the, can you flip things out? Does that show up on That's fine. <laughs> anyway, I worked there until I got my new Um, where were you December 7th? In Baltimore. I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was Sunday afternoon, and we were, the people I lived with, they had two daughters, and we were dancing around with our big band kind of music, and it came over the radio up at Pearl Harbor. Of course, we were just stunned. And then we all started calling up the people, boys that we went with that were in the service, just, you know, right away. And I guess everybody in the United States was doing the same thing because you couldn't get through. And it was just a terrible time, scary. And it was something, see, I never thought would happen. I just, it was foolish because a lot of young people when we were at the beach and all would talk about the coming war. They thought that the uh, Germans would invade Czechoslovakia. And I was one of those naive, like, oh, no, we've never had war in our time. And it won't happen, you know. So it was like I couldn't believe such a horrible thing. What made you consider joining the military? Well, I was so patriotic, and I just thought, that's so horrible what they've done, and I've got to do something. And at the time, they didn't have a, a whack. So I don't remember. They might have. The first ones I remember, I think, was the Navy. But anyway, they weren't. And you couldn't go into until you were 21. So, but I started thinking about it. And then when I was 21, I... Did any of your siblings enlist? My two brothers did, yeah. They were both in, both in the Army, one the Air Force and one the regular Army. Um, did, what were your expectations when you joined the WACs? Oh, I thought I was going to replace a soldier. And he, you know, I'd help win the war because he could go fight. At that time, the women didn't do didn't have guns or didn't, our training wasn't anything to do with fighting. It was more like, actually it was like camp, summer camp or something. But uh, I really thought I'd replace a soldier. And, and I was so hoping I'd go overseas. And they did send wax on all overseas, but I wasn't one of them. So that was a disappointment. Um, what were the living conditions like? It was really, to me, I have nothing bad like to say about any of it, yet I got out. Um, to me, it was I had never been to camp. I had a feeling it was like that. And I look back and it said, when I listen to myself on other interviews, I think it sounds like kid stuff. It doesn't sound like an adult. I think a 21-year-old girl now wouldn't sound the same. But the world is so different. We, here, we all we did is march. And I think we must have had some first aid courses because we had classes, but we really didn't have any class about, well, I think now they'd have them about weapons probably uh, signal course stuff and things like that. But so it was really very, very mild, more like high school. The calisthenics were very simple too. You see in the movies now how they have to do all the things the men do, climb up those ropes and you know, everything. all we did is this kind of stuff. So it was very simple. What 
position did you hold in the lab? Well, when I joined, of course, I was a private first class. And then after basic training and after school, we went to, uh, went to um, administration school. But once I got working in the office in the Port of the Region, uh, I became a it wasn't called sergeant. Our names were a little different than the Army. It was technician third grade or something like that. It was equivalent to a sergeant. So, but it, it, I, my, uh, the man I worked with, the captain in the office where I worked, I said to him, tell me about this. First of all, I said, you know, how come I got this sergeant? Thing? He said he just wanted to get me sergeant stripes because he thought it would be nice. But what if my job didn't require it? I had no authority at the camp, you know, in our barracks. It was just that I got more pay. And it was a nice thing to do. So it didn't do me any good, like I could take charge of the some people. Um, where around the country were you working? Well, first I was in Oglethorpe, Georgia for basic training. And then went to uh, Commerce, Texas, a little town in eastern Texas. Uh, in fact, we used the East State Teachers College for a campus. And through the years, I've wondered where the regular college kids went. They must have had another campus because there's no, nobody was in our place. And nice big buildings. We were lucky because it wasn't like the rest of the army. It was, we had rooms, college kids' rooms, and, that, and a better mess hall and things, a nicer looking place. And then from there went to uh, Wilmington, California, the Port of Embarkation, where I thought I was going overseas. I never did. What did your basic training consist of? Just looking back, it was a little first aid stuff, a little learning army, you know, things about the army, the history, I suppose, I don't remember it, and also uh, marching. And I loved it. I loved marching. I could have marched the whole, through the whole war in that. Um, what was a typical day of work as a well, you'd get up at the crack of dawn, no matter where. Basic training, and the next place, the school, and even the last place in the port of embarkation. That was different. The day was different, but it started the same. You had to get up. You had to have everything exactly in the right. Your clothes were hung in a certain way. Like, you couldn't have your coat. You know, you come in and put your coat on the hanger any way you want. It had to be here. Turned, all, everything had to be turned the same way. Buttons would be on. <clears throat> and then, I don't remember now what it was, but you, everything had to be a certain place. And then you had a foot locker, which had to be open, and the tray had to have certain things in certain places. You couldn't have your socks here instead of there. Oh, and your shoes were all lined up under your clothes, uh, not in the foot locker. And you couldn't have your shoes at all. You could put sneakers here and shoes there. You had to do it. Things like that. And your bed had to be made, and it had to be so tight that if they dropped a quarter on it, it would bounce. It would you know, just flop in. So they marked you. The sergeant came in, and you stood at attention while she did all, made marks for any little thing you had wrong. And then you had to go up. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe you went up first. I don't remember. But you had to stand at attention outside. Look you over and everything. So you had to do that every morning before you went to work. And if you were sick, you couldn't just say, I'm sick and stay in bed. You had to go through all that and then go on sick call, which was marching you over to a, a little hospital like place. And then they uh, let you go back to your barracks. And we cheated like that. When I was in the, the school, we uh, didn't want to go to, we wanted to get out of everything. So we went down and got a sick call and had to sit on benches waiting to see the doctor. And there was a big radiator and we were all leaning over the radiator and all trying to make our temperatures go up. It evidently worked a little bit because we got out, we could go to our room. And, and I, we had to go down for a meal though. So we had to be pretty, if you were real sick, I guess it would Were the women in the wax 
respected as being a part of the military? Well, they, they actually weren't part. They were an auxiliary at that time. They were later years, they were made part of the Army. But at that moment, they weren't. I, I guess in some sense, yes. I think it was the lay people, the people of Memorial, and some of the soldiers. But the, in certain places, the people really didn't receive us that well because they had this notion. And I've been reading a lot about it lately. I have a book about women in the service. And I didn't realize how it was all over the place. I thought maybe I just felt that way in a few of us. But it was a real problem that people thought there was like a fan, a years ago camp followers. Oh, they were like prostitutes and things. So it really made you angry to have people feel that way. And I think some of the soldiers kind of, like they think you're, they could pick you up. As, they said, we're all in the same boat. And it, it used to make me so mad. I mean, if I thought they were cute or something, I probably, you know, you wouldn't mind meeting them. But to have them have that attitude. So we got so, when we were in uh, Wilmington at the Board of Embarkation, they changed a lot of the rules. When you were in training, it was different. But they allowed us, they got so they said, you don't have to wear your uniform after you're off work. So we never put them on again at night. Because we used to go out and eat dinner at hotels and all. Because we didn't like the food. And people said, your families would send you money. So we spent all the money on going to a hotel and eating dinner. And we wore street clothes. which Because we were embarrassed be in uniform because of the way people felt about it. So I guess that was universal. Just, and I think it happened in other wars with the way they felt about nurses or any, you know, there was a problem about that always. Um, what was it like interacting with soldiers who had been overseas? Well, I, I really didn't in have any interaction with the soldiers who had been overseas. Uh, they were all either staying here, or the ones I met after I was working were all going overseas, except the ones that worked at the place. So we had, and then I might not meet the, so I would see the soldiers, because they had a lot of entertainment, they'd entertain them on the deck of the battleships, which was really exciting. Because we, here you are in a port of embarkation on the west coast, and they had barrage balloons because of incoming planes and all that. And you'd be on the deck of a ship during the war, and it'd be hush-hush, and low lights, because it'd be too dangerous to have lights. So it was very dramatic. Well, you'd meet other, you know, meet guys that way. But outside of that, the only ones I really got to know were ones that worked on the base, and also the uh, officers that came into our office, the supply officers that had a check everything they had on ship, all the supplies and stuff, and they kept, I worked in an office where they took that information. So you'd meet them and you knew that they were leaving, you know. That was sad, made you feel bad. But outside of that, I didn't come into contact with them. Um, were you aware of what was happening, like, throughout the world at this time? Yes, but you know, I look back. I certainly cared, but it's so different than it is now. Or maybe it's our age. And of course the news, that's another thing. All you had is newspapers. And I don't think a lot of young people, even patriotic you know, ones, read every, you know, you didn't have a whole lot of time and that's not what you wanted to read. And the radio, it wasn't like now. There's no television. So you really didn't get all the news. Or it was a big thing if you went to movies, they had newsreels. And the, so it was, it was so different in that way. And you only came in contact like with the brass, with what they told you. And when they entertained troops, the Hollywood people were so good to the service people. So you always were in that bubble, like part of the group, but not really knowing everything and believing everything. You know, I didn't do that anymore. Um, what year did you get out of the I think it was 43, a long time ago. I good about it, but I had my discharge papers and stuff. Um, what made you make that decision? Well, at the, uh, whatever, whatever year it was, they decided
decide to have the, uh, the wax be part of the regular army. So they couldn't just say, okay, you're part of the army. They would, you'd have to get out and re-enlist because they weren't drafting us. You know, they never drafted one yet. So once people knew you could get out, I think I've thought of that so many years too. If they hadn't said that, I probably would never have gotten as discontent. But I think it's a natural thing for soldiers, especially really brave privates and corporals and sergeants. Maybe. So they start making you think. So we start thinking all the bad things, how the people thought we were tramps, and that I wasn't going to do what I thought I was going to do. I, oh, and besides, I had asked my uh, captain also in my office, I said, tell me about the soldier I'm replacing. I really want to know about him. So he said, what? And he had a couple times asked me what I was talking about. He said, you're not replacing anybody. They made this job for you. I was so, oh gosh, I thought that is so bad. I, I didn't feel very important, like I was doing anything. And then I thought, here I'm doing this dumb stuff and not even getting paid much. That wouldn't have bothered me if I thought I was doing something worthwhile. But that got me. So all those things came to a head. It wasn't anything about the war. It was so different then. I was never doubted that we were doing the right thing. I have never felt that way again but at that time. So once you know you could get out, a lot of us got out. And they sent, they sent all kinds of people, big shots, wax and stuff, to talk to us, just in our one little company, because there was so many. I've lost track. Maybe in that whole area, maybe 60 people got out, which is a lot. So they couldn't talk us into staying there. So I went home. How did you feel when the war finally came to an end? Well, gosh, it was wonderful. I remember that day, too. Because I was in Marietta, not Marietta, a little town in Georgia, uh, visiting a friend who worked with me. And it was a little town in the south. And her grandfather had been, I think, in the Civil War. So he was sitting there, a little old man, and we, it was announced that uh, the war was over, the war in uh, Europe. And we, this town went crazy. All the pictures showed in New York City and all, they really had a great time. It was just a little southern town. So it was a, a kind of an interesting place to be at that time. So we were just so happy that it was over. How did your experience as a whack affect you? Uh, well, when I got out, the immediate uh, thing was, it's, it was a strange thing. It's kind of like a person has been in prison, and they get out, and they're self-conscious around the people. I went through, and I wasn't even in there so long. But I felt self-conscious, like people could tell I was different and that I had been a soldier. And I don't know why that would make you feel self-conscious, but it did. I felt really, in fact, when we came home on the train, another girl and myself were coming in the same direction. And we didn't want anybody on the train to know we'd been waxed. But they gave you your uh, makeup kits and your pajamas and a couple other things. Your pocketbooks were definitely service, people could tell. And we didn't, we didn't want anybody to know it. And in those days, you just uh, had, uh, on the train, you just had your births. So you had to go to the, uh, a little dressing room and bathroom at the end of the car to get dressed. And other women and all were in there. We were like hiding our makeup kits. And all. So I would, laughed. I thought it was just like coming home from uh, jail and not wanting anybody to know you've been a prisoner or something. So it did it that way. It took me a little while to get used to being home and living like a regular person. And I think that's remarkable when I think how, that I wasn't in. I imagine people who were in for years must really have a hard time. But the overall effect, I think I kind of forgot about it. I guess I was a little partly guilty feeling about getting out. So, and I didn't come into contact with other people who'd been in service. So I really didn't pay much attention. It just kind of drifted.
drifted out of my mind. And um, so, and then you get married and have children and all that. So it's really been more in the last few years since Vietnam and being a, a service person, being a veteran. It comes out again because people are interested in a woman veteran, especially my age. You know, it does a lot of good if you're doing anti-war work because people think, well, she looks like a substantial, you know, not a weirdo or something, and look at how she feels. So I think it, it helps the cause a lot. Men too, but I think even be having a somebody from World War II, a woman. So I've thought of it a lot, and I've been interviewed, and also. It's, Things are in my mind. It's fun to think back, and you sometimes are surprised at your own feelings. And when you think of how long ago it was, you don't know how accurate you feel. You know, things you think maybe weren't, weren't quite the way I think. Or, but I'm, I never was sorry I'd been in. It was an experience, and as time goes on, I'm happier that I had that experience. How do you feel? I think it's a horrible, terrible thing. I think it's illegal, immoral, and I think that we have every right to do everything we can to stop it. And I don't even know if, I don't know if war is ever the answer. Because if you always think there's a possibility of war, then it'll never stop. But if they study more like percentage says, running for president now, that they should have a Department of Peace. There should be so much more that they do to keep from having wars, but they don't settle anything. It's a few years later, these enemies are your friends, and it's, it's terrible. Especially when you know that we attack them, and that's a terrible thing for a country to do. Thank you. You're welcome.